Thanks for joining us on Off the Press on The Breakfast. Let's take a look at the Punch newspaper. The headline still remains on the VAT collection row. It says, no going back on bail. Lagos insists. Adamawa backs Wiki. No point stay in action. Court has dismissed FIRS stay of execution. That's according to Lagos. Adamawa Hale's reverse court judgment says it will improve state's revenue. Above that headline on the Punch newspaper, Nigeria's bilateral loans rise by 145% in five years. States to submit PIA proposed amendments at next Federal Account Allocation Committee meeting. Ingege says the federal government is not owing doctors and other health workers' salaries. Citizens, foreigners, scared of investing in Nigeria. That's according to the NESG. Ten banks rake in 266 billion naira from account maintenance and e-banking fees. Ten banks rake in 266 billion naira from account maintenance and e-banking fees. Keep Southwest safe, Oyotola tells Amoteku. Buhari warns service chiefs as Katsina Kaduna bandits abduct 26. Fear groups Ogun community as 25 die of cholera. Oil, gas, GDP contribution drops by 3.25 trillion naira in two years. 64-year-old Ogun estate agent allegedly defiles two-year-old. OAU dismisses lecturer over sexual harassment of students and National Assembly berates INEC as commission insists on electronic results. All right, let's move to the daily independent newspapers. Should be on your screen. Uh, next, yes, it says on insecurity. Again, Buhari gives service chiefs marching orders. Worried bandits attacks becoming more persistent. Six Super Tucano aircraft on test flight, says Magashi. Also, why Nigeria can't achieve competitive private sector-led economy, and that's by the NESG. Wiki asks the UN to tell Buhari to conduct free and fair elections in 2023. Also on the Daily Independent, Sunday Igboho court extends restraining order against AGF and DSS. Namdekanu demands 5 billion naira damages, apology from Malami and the DSS. Still on the Daily Independent, no plan by NCC to shut down telecom sites in Katsina. Federal government fingered frustrating trade facilitation at ports. Um, and also, we don't need additional laws for e-transmission of results, says INEC. Says it doesn't need NCC to nod to transmit results electronically. And uh, finally, Dr. Strike lingers as Ngigi alleges campaign uh, of calumny against federal government. Insists no medical staff is owed salaries. Let's uh, um, look at the next newspaper now, the leadership. The headline reads, 2023 permutation changes as North Central lobbies APC PDP for tickets. Okay. Says region should produce next president for fairness, equity and justice. Disowns politicians from North Central seeking party national chairmanship positions. Again, PMB orders security chiefs to end abductions and killings as bandits abduct 18 in Kaduna State. Sultan tells northern governors domesticate Child Rights Act now. National Assembly can't legislate on grazing. That's according to senior advocates of Nigeria. FG urged to sell $900 billion dead assets. Nigeria Assembly condemns 300,000 Waek and Neko fees. Ned Uoku tackles governors over for a $10 million Paris Club refund. All right. Now moving on to the Guardian newspapers. NSA absent as service chiefs get fresh um, order to end Keelans. Nigeria takes delivery of another batch of Super Tucano jets next week. And terrorists in Zamfara being clothed as bandits, says Akira Dulu. Lagos Fiber Project to go up 82 billion naira amid uh, uh, ROW change concern, uh, charges concerns. Um, INEC insists on e-transmission of results without recourse to NCC. Also on The Guardian, 
Gunmen abduct 26 in Kaduna and Katsina. 15 feared dead as cholera, out cholera outbreak hits Ogun. And uh, lockdown anxiety as Buhari visits Emo tomorrow. Those are the big ones on the Guardian newspapers. And uh, just before you know, we have our guest uh, join, I think we can quickly just chip in on the um, service chiefs being given more orders. Um, you know, and you know, probably hearing this for the 92nd time in, in the last few years, it, it, it makes the headlines every now and then that they've been given fresh orders or fresh charges um, and all of that, uh, which I personally don't understand. If they have to, if the president needs to renew these charges every uh, three weeks, to make them valid, or you know, I, I don't know, you know, because I know that when they were sworn in, they were given orders, they knew what their responsibilities were, they knew uh, the reason that they were sworn in as a new service chief, so had these um, um, security agencies. So, so it's like ordering a cook does, to go ahead and cook, yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> you, why do you, why does the president need to give fresh orders every other week? Uh, to remind them of what they should do. They know um, if they aren't doing it, or if they're not working, then maybe you know, other things or a different approach needs to be taken, or maybe they should be fired. You know, I remember you know, before these new service chiefs came in, Nigerians clamored over and over and over and over and over you know, for either the second of the service chiefs or something, a totally different tactic. Um, but instead, you know, what the Nigerian president continued to do is the same thing, you know, give fresh orders, give fresh charges, every give you know, every other you know, period which um, doesn't seem to be working. Your fresh charges aren't working, your fresh orders aren't working because um, mm -hmm. like we've read in the news, gunmen have abducted another 26 in Kaduna and Katsina. Um, what needs to, to change? What needs to be done? Uh, what are the different questions that need to be asked? Mm -hmm. um, in what ways uh, do we need to do better? And you know, I, I think we, we've had these security conversations for so long without bringing in you know, our, our borders. Um, I don't here in anywhere where the government is speaking or giving fresh orders to immigration or to whoever is responsible to ensure that none of Nigeria's borders are porous. We have hundreds of porous borders across the country and certain parts of the country that people simply just walk between one country um, to the next, like, you know, you're walking across the street. Um, and that's, you know, has been a challenge security wise. I don't hear a lot of voice from the presidency concerning closing those borders. Where do these weapons come from? These terrorists, and I've said it so many times, these terrorists, mm -hmm. are, these aren't locally made um, weapons. The prol proliferation of arms in Nigeria is one of the biggest challenges with, with regard to security. Why aren't there any fresh orders to ensure that we completely put this to an end? Who is funding these terrorists? Where are they making money from? Who is backing them? Who, you know, exactly is responsible for all the deaths that have happened in Nigeria in the last few years? There has to be funding from somewhere. There has to be money that is being made from either the um, um, levies that they, you know, the small taxes that they tax villagers in certain parts of the country or the money that they get from, you know, um, ransom payments or some of all of that. Mm -hmm. But there is funding coming from somewhere that the federal government needs to speak on. And I don't hear that either. I remember the UAE, I believe, had pointed out, that, you know, that they had, you know, discovered some people who were financing uh, terrorism in Nigeria. The United States also offered to help Nigeria uh, find out the people who are responsible for terrorism financing in Nigeria. There's still no fresh orders concerning mm -hmm. that. And so it looks or it sounds very much like a, you know, a, a you know every four market days, go put out a new fresh order, you know, tell the newspapers that we've given a fresh order to these And beyond chiefs. the fresh order, we need to point out that kidnapping and insecurity are still on the rise. I mean, on, on The Guardian, it says that gunmen have blocked at 26 in Kaduna and Katsina. We saw the story as well on the Daily Independent about, you know, insecurity. Um, we saw it as well on the leadership newspaper, uh, Bandits Abduct 18 in Kaduna. It's also on the Punch newspaper here. You know, so what really are uh, happening to the orders? Are they just empty words? Because I keep saying that political will seems to be the challenge. So you could come ahead and release a million press releases and nothing changes. Is what are the actions being put in place? What are the results of these committees that are being set up on insecurity? President Muhammad Buhari had a security meeting yesterday. So I'm sure that's where he gave those orders. So what really is the outcome? Let's see, like, what are the practicable outcome that we can see on ground beyond all the big words and the big grammar? Yeah, and, and at the end of all of this, there's still the foundational reason why terrorism and banditry and murders and some of all of this was able to grow so fast in Nigeria 
there are still those reasons that don't seem to be, you know, addressed in any way. In these different states, bear in mind that the NCC and, the, you know, the government had put out a statement that it was going to be shutting down telecom networks in, in different, in different regions. And exactly. And states. But it still doesn't seem to have answered the questions concerning insecurity. See, and how do people also put out di uh, distress calls without having good te uh, telecom um, um, services? So there, there is many, many of these Sarge, conversations. I don't even want to enter to... the conversation about you know, my response to um, the recent issue where, you know, NCC was directed to go ahead and shut all telecommunications networks in Zamfara State and neighboring state because of insecurity. I don't understand how that works. Maybe I need a security expert to clear that for me, but you basically shut down communication in a whole state simply because you want to get terrorists. What happened to our names, our BVNs, and all these digital fr footprints that we have for you to be able to track when kidnappers you know, kidnap people and they make calls for ransom payments? What stops us from going ahead to track those phone numbers that leads us you know, on the trail of these kidnappers? Do you have to now shut down the whole state? Do you know how much will be lost by the telecommunications companies, people who can communicate, who need those communications for business and just social interaction? It's just like killing a fly with a sledgehammer, in my opinion. Well, the fly is not dead, obviously. <laughs> um, you know, and the sledgehammer has been swung left and right. It still hasn't killed oh. the fly. Um, but once again, there's so many questions that need to be answered mm -hmm. um, with regards to insecurity and why the tactics don't seem to be working. And until we're being honest and until we find a political will to actually answer those questions, we'll continue to beat around the bush. Hmm. All right. So um, we know the whole conversation regarding electronic transmission of result. This was a really, you know, debated issue in our politics in the past few weeks and months. And on the Punch newspaper, we see the story surfacing here again. And it's about, um, it's uh, on the front page of the Punch newspaper. It says, National Assembly berates INEC as commission insists on um, electronic transmission of results. And we talked about this earlier, asking... What exactly is the challenge with electronic transmission of results? And people say, oh, so um, it, you know, it just limits the ability to steal votes and all of that because there are you know, digital trails that links and connects everything. But I, I believe that if it's an independent National Electoral Commission, they should be allowed to take independent decisions as to you know, how the election should be run. And if they say electronic transmission of results is the way to go, I don't see why there should be such opposition to it by the lawmakers. So what then is independent about them? What, I mean, it's basically taking their powers from being the constitutionally recognized agency or commission in the government or in the country to be able to you know, go ahead and conduct elections independent of any influence. So all this influence is seen left, right, and center. It really is you know, just picking on the mandates of INEC and then, you know, it also seems to threaten our electoral process. We know the challenge with uh, the manual election coalition and all of that, ballot box snatching. You have challenges where people say, oh, they're in riverine areas. We can't go there to receive, uh, receive um, uh, you know, the, the vote. You know, we can't distribute electoral materials. So I believe it's 2021. It's the digital age. Anik is talking about, you know, a new IVED and all of that. So why don't we just migrate everything online and make everything easy and seamless for everyone. But that, that really is what it is. The National Assembly is just against it. Well, I think it had already been established, um, you know, in the initial time when this conversation started, that, you know, it should be annex responsibility, not the NCC and not the National Assembly, mm -hmm. um, you know, to make that decision, you know. And, of course, the laws are also clearly uh, state that. Um, since the 2019 elections, or prior to the 2019 elections, there was conversations about the Electoral Act um, um, uh, being passed, you know, and, and all of that, and the eagerness of the current administration to ensure Electoral that we have free amendment. Uh, amendment yeah. Yeah. Um, um, the eagerness of the current administration to ensure that we have free and fair elections. I remember then, you know, the president had said that it was too soon um, or too close to the elections, mm. and you know that that bill <clears> wouldn't be signed at that time. Um, but we've had. Two years passed since that election. You know, we're heading towards the next elections. Um, in what ways is the current administration going to ensure that there are free and fair elections in 2023? Mm -hmm. And how much interest does the current Nigerian political elites and those in government want? Or how much interest do they have, really, in free and fair elections? That's really what the, the bone of contention is here. Um, the electoral process, the, the, the process through which Nigerians place people in positions of power has been screw, skewed for a very, very long time. There's, there's always, always been that challenge with that process. 
um, which government is going to own up to those mm -hmm. failures. I remember, you know, there's a, a quote by former President uh, um, Moser Adwa who said that the process that brought him into power was, you know, faulty, I believe. Um, there's been enough time for us to make amendments to that process. There's been enough time for us to fix what needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it's obvious that there is really not much interest in correcting those errors to ensure that when people stand in line to vote next time, it will be free and fair. Okay, so I, I, I had to dig up the quotes for you regarding the situation. Um, so basically, um, the NCC, the Nigerian Communications Commission, is basically saying that, you know, Nigeria does not have the capacity to electronically transmit results. And um, the National Assembly is asking INEC to go ahead and seek approval of the NCC, work with them to see how they can electronically transmit results. So INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu is saying that um, they have put systems in place. He you know, began to point out the newly introduced bimodal voter ac accreditation system. He said this will replace the smart card reader, it will replace the Z-pad, and it will take care of challenges of overvoting and uh, double voting. And you know, he went on to say that um, it's unconstitutional. You know, let me read his quote here. He said, this is absolutely unconstitutional. You cannot ask INEC to seek the approval of another agency of government to transmit results electronically when INEC actually has the powers to impose duties on NCC to achieve that result. Do you understand? INEC, according to Professor Mamou Yikubu, how he's interpreting it, has the power to actually go ahead and impose duties on the NCC so that electronic um, results, election results can be transmitted electronically, not you know, the National Assembly asking INEC to go and seek approval from the NCC to conduct elections. So it's, it really seems like a power play here. Um, who has uh, the most, who, who can show the most force? The NCC, National Assembly, INEC. And then they're also asking INEC to go and seek more interpretation of the Constitution. But I, I really don't know if the court needs to step in here. It's a question I've asked our political analysts on the show. That does INEC need to seek, you know, a, a legal um, redress does INEC need to seek the judicial interpretation of the law regarding INEC's mandate to independently conduct elections in the country because it now seems like everything needs to end up in the courts these days and you know things that seem to be black and white INEC should be able to independently conduct elections now seem to be something of controversy well um, just a reminder that whatever decision that Nigeria makes um, in 2023 mm -hmm. is going to last for another four years and four years is not four hours, neither is it four days. It's four whole years of that political decision. Um, and if we're not able to fix our leadership selection process, then we very likely would find ourselves as a country in either, you know, a very, very bad situation for four years, very likely eight um, years of a person's life. And I, I want every Nigerian, okay. those who don't seem to be concerned, those who don't want to get their um, uh, voter's card, those who think that, oh, you know, it's best to... Um, you know, uh, uh, ban elections in certain regions, those who think that, oh, the electoral process doesn't fit for mm -hmm. them so they will not vote. Um, I want everyone to be reminded that it's eight years of your life, um, which, you know, you, you probably should calculate how old you would be in the next eight years or in the next 10 years. So you can imagine what um, you would have to deal with if you make a bad politi political decision. And the Nigerian leadership also needs to be very, very aware that these are 200 million lives that are going to be affected by whatever decision is made in 2023. Has, it, it should, they should find a way to make it less of their personal political interest mm -hmm. and more of the, the lives of the citizens. Millions of people that will be affected by that decision in 2023. Okay. So um, I want us to quickly talk about this story. It, 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 it seems to be a story about the failure of healthcare in Nigeria, where Juhesu, NAD, you know, medical unions in Nigeria are going on strike, um, saying that they're not being paid salaries, their welfare is not being, you know, valued in the country. But on the front page of the Punch newspaper, there's a story there that says that Ingege, said that the federal government is not owing doctors and other health workers salaries. So what happened here is um, there was an open session of the meeting of the Presidential Committee on Salaries with leadership of the Joint Health Sector Unions in Abuja on Tuesday. Now, at this meeting, the Minister of Labor and Employment, Chris Ngigi, insisted that the federal government is not owing any worker salary is not owing any doctor or healthcare worker salaries in the country. Now, he said that the only workers who were not paid were doctors who were illegally recruited. So he said, 
if you have not been paid salaries as a doctor, so the people who've been interviewing who say that they have not been paid salaries, he says that they are illegally recruited doctors and that um, they are illegally rec recruited because they were not captured by the office of the head of service of the Federation and that their payments were not provided for by the budget office. This is what he's basically saying, that all doctors um, who were legally recruited have been paid because they were captured by the budget office. So he says NAD goes about telling Nigerians that the government owes them salaries and that the government is not taking problems in the healthcare sector serious, but that that is incorrect. He says, quote, no doctor, no nurse, no pharmacist, or any other healthcare worker, including the driver, is owed monthly salary. Government pays as at when due. So um, maybe we need to get NAD and other um, health bodies um, back on the conversation table to see exactly where we're missing it. Um, yes, um, and while these this bickering is going on, Nigerians are being affected. You know, Nigerian lives, of course, will be lost in this period. Uh, we're talking about the cholera outbreak that has mm -hmm. killed more than 2,000 people. We're still dealing with COVID-19. Yes. There's a lot of, um, you know, health emergencies that need to be, yeah, that need to be um, addressed in hospitals while all this bickering is going on. Um, what is the Nigerian government's um, core interest with regards to health care? Um, are you, are we, how long are we going to play politics, you know, with some of all of this? Um, and, you know, you can see pretty much the same reaction from, so maybe Ngege will also tell us that if people are complaining, maybe some of you have not been properly recruited. But, but funny enough, that's um, it. He's saying that they're not on IPPIS. They're not on the well, national system. Well, but the university different. state, they have their own. So no, I mean, it's the same thing because it's saying that they are not recognized or captured in their own, you know, system of payment. Their payment, yeah. So the payment system is, is different from being illegally recruited <laughs> entirely, you know. So maybe that's what he should also say to uh, to uh, ASUP, those lecturers, you know, and to ASUP. And any other person is going to go on strike, you know, and tell them that you, we have been paying people. Anybody who's complaining is, you know, was not legally recruited. Um, and what next after be after the legal recruitment? Is it going to also then ensure that the government, you know, goes after those who are carrying out illegal recruitment of doctors and lecturers and whoever else, uh, you know, and put them. On the, on the government's payroll or not. So after, you know, all this bickering, I'm sure, I hope that the Nigerian government understands that its duty um, is to the Nigerian people and to ensure that Nigerian lives and property are protected. And so when there is failure because of its, you know, um, you know inconsistency, because of its politics, mm -hmm. because of some of these lackluster behavior that we're seeing, the Nigerian government should understand that it, it should be able to own up to that failure to protect lives and property. Um, and, um, you know, and that re with re regards insecurity and healthcare and failure of basic infrastructure and some of all of that. Um, I hope, you know, that they get, you know, to, uh, to settle some of these issues as quickly as possible and we can get our doctors back in the hospital. Amen. Let's take a break here and take us back in time. I'm going back to the year 1986 when Oprah went national. And I'll be telling you about um, uh, an event in Tehran that basically changed history in that country in 1978. Stay with us.